Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Christopher Harder. I'm the Deputy Director of the Amistad Research Center. On behalf of our Board of Directors and our Executive Director, Dr. Karen T. College, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, evening's event. Uh, thank you for joining us for this program entitled Becoming Danielle Metz, Life After Incarceration. Is that a little bit better? That is a little bit better. I can hear myself now. So, well, again, welcome everyone. Uh, the Amistad Research Center is an independent, nonprofit, community based archives with a focus on uh, collecting, preserving, and providing access to materials that reference the history of ethnic communities in the United States, civil rights, and social justice movements. We work with many partners in the New Orleans community and beyond, and certainly on the campus of Tulane University. We're uh, very pleased to be partnering with the Newgum Art Museum on occasion of her sister, incarcerated, incarcerated women of Louisiana. If you've not had an opportunity to see the exhibition uh, yet at, at Newcomb, I do definitely encourage you to do so. In fact, they will be having late hours after this evening's talk for you to take part in that exhibition. The theme of tonight's event also gives me the opportunity to announce another collaboration that Amistad will be undertaking uh, with another department on Tulane's campus, and that's with the Tulane Law Clinic, the University Law Clinic. We will begin archiving the records of court cases that the Law Clinic has worked on in the areas of mass incarceration, environmental justice, juvenile justice, and related topics. Those materials will begin coming to Amistad and be available for access later this year. So please keep your eyes and ears open as we announce more information about that partnership as well. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, there are over 200,000 women and girls imprisoned for nonviolent crimes as a result of the criminal system's war on drugs. In addition to those serving sentences, an additional one million are trapped in a system of probation and parole with very little support services available to assist them while transitioning back into society. Tonight, we will hear from Danielle Metz about her experience in the criminal system, being granted clemency by President Barack Obama and the reentry process. She is joined on stage by Carmen James Randolph, Vice President of Programs for the Greater New Orleans Foundation, who has spearheaded the creation of the Second Chance Fund, which, is crea which was created by the foundation. The Second Chance Fund has provided grants to organizations such as Goodwill and the First 72 Plus to help returning citizens overcome seemingly small barriers to reestablishing their lives, fines and fees, a state-issued ID, security deposits on housing, uniforms, and tools. The first 72 plus leveraged these funds to start a revolving loan pool to help returning citizens start a business or purchase a home. In addition, under Carmen's leadership, the Greater New Orleans Foundation's workforce program, New Orleans Works, has encouraged employer partners such as Oxner Health Center to rethink its policies regarding job seekers with criminal histories. Carmen serves on the Workforce Development Board of the New Orleans and co-chairs the Greater New Orleans Funders Network. Please join me in welcoming Danielle Metz and Carmen James Randolph. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening, and I am thrilled to be talking to Danielle Metz. 
So Danielle, let's let's go back. Let's go back to the 1990s and think about who you were at that time. You know, Deanna Jackson was singing uh, uh, That's the Way Love Goes. <laughs> and I know you were a young mother. And just think about that time and introduce us to who Danielle was at that time. At that time, Danielle was a young, free-spirited person. And it's ironic that you would say Janet Jackson, because that's who I wanted to be. <laughs> that's who I really thought I was back in the day. And she is one of, she is my favorite of all after Beyonce. <laughs> but in 1993, you know, 1993, yeah. And I was just free-spirited by then. My thought pattern has changed because I had two kids that I had to be responsible for. I couldn't be as free as I wanted to be because I had to think about my son and my daughter. And of course, you know, <coughs> me being in love, that kind of thing. So why don't you tell us, how did you find yourself in this situation? How did you find yourself incarcerated, sentenced to three life sentences, a non-violent offender with no prior record? Well, I had been indicted um, for drug charges. It was my first offense, and um, when that happened, I was really devastated. I can't really explain, but what the judge had said to me, it really became something in my mind every night because he had told me that I had forfeited my rights to live in a humane society. And for a judge to tell someone at the age of 26, something like that, and for the really mean it, you know, that was like devastating to me. I can't really explain it, but I was like broken, you know, just my whole spirit, he broke everything about me at that time. But I, you know, I had something to hold on to because I had faith as my anchor. And I prayed and um, I met people along the way when I first came, this woman right here, um, Ms. Ardell Wilson, she was the sheriff or uh, the deputy, the main deputy in the OPP. And when I came there, they had, had the whole city under siege. And when I got back there, she said, this the little girl everybody's talking about? This can't be true. So she got me straight one good time. And you know, she said, I don't know if you run it out there, but you don't run nothing in here. I run this. And I said, okay. And ever since then, we've been the best of friends. And she started the journey with me. You know, she kept encouraging me and telling me, baby, everything gonna be all right. Don't worry about that, baby. But that was hard for baby, because she didn't know every night baby big one that cell and think about what the judge had said to me. That I had forfeited in my right to live in a humane society. And it really just, it done something to me, them some words I'll never forget. I read once that you said that you just couldn't wrap your mind around what a life sentence meant. And could you tell us a little bit about what it was like to be incarcerated with that on your shoulders, that you had a life sentence? What was that experience for as a life of? As a life, well, again, it was devastating for me. It's something that I really couldn't talk about. Um, if you go back to the other picture, me and the three girls, this young lady right here and there was Deanne Coffin with the jeans outfit on. And she and I was going through traffic together with we two young girls. She had life sentence as well. And she was beginning, because she was kind of bitter, and I was bitter too inside. I wouldn't let it be spoken because I couldn't believe that I was actually here. This was becoming my reality for now. And she told me she got that life plus five years. And I think I like it. She said, yeah. And she was the first person that I confided in because we've been trained in Oklahoma City. And I told her, I said, I got life too. And she said, they did us wrong. And I said, yeah, they did us wrong. And she was my first friend, the first person that I met. And it, it was just hard for me to just grasp, just to think about you. You know, I was 26 years old. I hadn't even lived before. And then for three licenses plus 20 years, that's excessive for a first time nine thousand offender. I didn't kill anyone. Of course, I made some bad choices and decisions, but nothing I could have done should have married the type of sentence that I was handed down. Absolutely. Being a young mother is hard enough. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine 
what it was like. You had two babies when you wrote. Right. What was it like trying to mother from prison? It was very difficult because, for one, I didn't know um, how really to explain to my son that I had life because I always told him I was coming home and a family member, him and a family member, passed words or something. Someone told him that his mother had life. So I wasn't even ready to accept it for myself and that only explain to him. And I didn't know how to explain that to a seven-year-old boy that his mother had a life sentence. So I did the best I could. I told him that I had life, but that didn't mean that what it meant. It was just a sentence. But over time, things will change. And you know, when you're telling him stuff like that, um, he won't believe it, but he's going into adulthood, turning 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, you know, without me, and I'm still telling him I'm gonna come home one day. You know, and even me telling it to him, sometimes I fate will waver as well. When you and I spoke before tonight, you said something that was so true to me, and that was when a loved one is incarcerated, it's like the family is incarcerated too. So, and the system doesn't make it easy for us to be family when someone is incarcerated. And you were all the way in California. So how did your family support you through that time? Well, they supported me as best as they could. They did a great job, you know. Everything is almost like your family is in prison when you're in prison because, you know, you have your mother out there, she's working, trying to provide for you, and she's sending her hard-earned money back to the prison to make sure you have the things that you need. My sister, she had to readjust her life, change her whole life around to take care of my kids and, you know, adjust everything because, you know, she's supposed to be living her own life by now, but now she has to be a mother in the aspect to my kids. Then I had my son's grandmother who, you know, I don't get to thank her much, but she's done a remarkable job with my son, my daughter, you know, both of them have never given me a problem the whole time I've been in prison. That says a lot because, you know, the system says, the statistics say that they probably end up in prison themselves. And neither one of them have ever had any kind of run-in with the law. Let's talk a little bit more about your mother. Your mother was your rock. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine what it was like for your mother mm -hmm. in your fight to be released. Because this, if you're telling your family you're going to come home, they're telling you you're going to come home. There was some fight behind that. And I'm sure there were times you lost your will to fight. How did your mom keep you going? Well, for one, my mom was a realist. And she know, my mom was so real that even when I was in prison, she would come. And even when I get ready to cry, or I get, you know, we get at the table and we have our little talk, she would always tell me, she said, well, ain't no sense in crying, you did what you wanted to do. And I said, yeah, but mom, you know, she said, but you did what you wanted to do. You know, I said, man, you're right. She said, so we just gonna sit here and eat these chicken wings. <laughs> and we're not gonna even worry about it. And if you get the grind, I'ma leave. Because I guess in her mind, she knew it was nothing she could do for me. And all she said, all you gotta do is have a little thing. I said, but you about to leave this. She said, yeah, but I didn't do nothing to give you. She kept it real with me. And all my sisters and brothers, you know. And she just, that's just the way she was. But I was her baby. The youngest, and she always emphasized that to my baby. She said, Help me, God, you're going to get up out of here. But it was hard every time she's coming, and I'm watching her leave all the time, and I can't cry and suppress that all the time because, like I said, she didn't think that it was nothing she could have done but pray for me at that point. And so she just always was honest with me and stuff, but I knew that um, when I had her, my brothers, and my sisters, I can always call them and get some encouragement from them from him, and they always told me, you know, just be strong, bro. You wanna get out there? Because sometimes I had to get that reassurance. I just called and said, you think I'm gonna get out of here? You know, and then my brother or my sister said, oh, you wanna get out of here? My sister would always say, girl, a breakthrough coming through, a breakthrough coming through. I'm like, okay. You know, and every Christmas, the same way, every Christmas when we get ready in our prayer, oh, your mama gonna be home this year, and I guess my poor kid's like, it's every year. Every year the same story. So when, she, when I finally 
got to that point, it was just like, you know, even before I came home two years before that, an officer had came so in 2014 I was going home, which wasn't actually the truth. And she just, I don't know, God told me to, uh, what was the reason for her telling it to me? And I called my son and I told him. And he's like, he is in bed. And he's like, you know, one of my good friends, she was all in the system. Her name ain't coming up in the system. She ain't going home. So my son said, is you, is you coming home, home? Or somebody told you this, or this, this is what you know, you believe, or you waiting on the clemency, because you ain't got it yet. Now you just told me you coming home. That was in 2014. Many of us who have not been um, in prison have no idea about the business of prison how it's become a business and how as a business it truly impacts families it impacts the experience of our loved ones who are locked up so let, let's talk about the business of prison for a little bit you you spoke of when you were um in you worked and worked for as little as 69 cents an hour many of us cannot even imagine what it would be like to do that. Could you talk about just the business of prison and labor and working? Well, well, prison for me is like modern day slavery. Because we get in there and we work for like 29 cents an hour. And I don't know if many of y'all know about the cricket phone company. When you say city and state, please, I was just city and state operator. The person that you were talking to on the phone. Because you know, in other countries, they outsource. So they were doing that with us in prison. So prison is a billion dollar industry, like these, not these particular chairs, but like the office chairs that you see, we manufacture those chairs. So you get all of us doing all this kind of work for little or nothing. And you know, sometime when I would answer the phone, I was being a 411 operator, I would get a five dollar incentive for the month to say a good job, good call handling time, accuracy and everything, five dollars. And when you go to the prison, inside the prison, in the back of it, they had a sign that said, the best kept secret, unicorn. And it was the best kept secret. And a lot of people don't know that, that that's what happens when we be on the inside, you know. So I, I wasn't one that wanted to work, but after you've been in prison for so long, and your family is steady sending money, you know, when your mom could send you $600 when you first started, and then it come down to $200 a month, then you have to get up and start doing something. But I was like, I'm not about to work for these people, but. When I worked for 411, that made me feel like I was outside because I can hear the kids in the car talking and they're like, give me Popeye's on Claiborne and, you know, and I'm here and I'm here. So that made me feel like I was outside. But the reality of it, at the end of the day, we still had to line up and count, go back to our cells, get counted three or four times a night, that kind of thing. So why did you need money? Because prison is like a world of its own. You're inside there, they have, you know, the movie theater, they have a store, you know, shoes like you might buy from Mervyn's might be $29. We pay like $65 for them. Everything, you know, like body washes you might get from Dollar Tree, where I love to go now and pay a dollar for it. There is $8, sometimes $10. And I'm talking about Christmas time. They mark everything up about two, three times the amount. So your family have to send extra money because it's Christmas, you know, you want to get your bonus, you got all us running away. Oh, they got body washes, they got this, they got that, they got candy, I'm a roper. I'm a roper, $10, $15, that kind of thing. Uh, just to go on that, the uh, necessities, were those things provided for you? The necessities, things that women need? Well, when I first started, it was provided. After a while, you had to pay for everything, all your feminine hygiene, everything, you know, even they had got down the toilet until she started paying for that. I just want to look at the audience that for a moment. How, how many of you in the audience have a loved one that's incarcerated? Quite a bit. And for those of you who don't have a loved one who's incarcerated, how many of you understand what Danielle is talking about? So you understand that our loved ones, our brothers, our sisters, who are locked up, have to pay for body wash, toiletries, pads, tampons. So to work for 29 cents an hour 
you need that in order to cover those expenses or to have family members who are generous in, in providing those supports for you. And talk about in terms of medical care. Were you able to access medical care while you were there? Yeah, I was able to access medical care, but you don't get the proper care when you're in there. That's something that two of my main things was if, you know, don't let anything happen to my mother while I was there and don't let me really get sick while I'm there because I know medical was really poor. Poor and when you someone like me, I hardly ever went to the medical because I you know, I've had in the program and every day I'm at work, you know, I'm on time, getting up, you know, a routine. And when you get sick you go to the hospital and they think you just wanna live. Everything, you know, some of my friends, I had about maybe eight friends died while they were there and they didn't have a license. And I think about them all the time because, you know, I still think about what they went through, how they used to go over there to medical and just ask for medicine and stuff like that. And they think they're faking because they don't want to go to the hospital. You know, they don't want to go to work that day, something like that. And, and you know, they died. So you have to tell their family members that they, you know, they're not coming home. And, and medical is really poor. The medical system is poor. Even with our dental, we had a lot of girls in there. We, you know, they didn't even have teeth for a long time. You know, when you don't have a beautiful smile, your teeth, that's the first thing that attacks your confidence, you know, in there. Uh, just period. And they will put all this black stuff in your mouth and, you know, I don't know what kind of feelings it was. And my son used to come and he said, oh, don't drink after me. You got all that black teeth. <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't drink after me. I was like, what? He said, what that is in your mouth? And that's feeling. That don't look like no feelings to me. That was our feelings. <laughs> we talked a little bit about trauma and the impact of trauma and how you um, yourself or just women that you met, that that was a common thing, that everyone had experienced something, um, whether it was in their childhood or in a relationship with a man, that that was a common thing that you experienced. And I'm, I'm just curious about if prison is supposed to be a place of rehabilitation, and we know that many people have experienced trauma who are there. What is the mental health care like in mental health services? A lot of people get mental health, but for me, it was a mind over matter because I know what it was like. You know, I've been there so long. I, I was there since I was 26. I came home at 49. And whenever you go to the site and you want to talk to somebody, the first thing they want to hear is Prozac or Zolo. Or, you know, they're not there to counsel you. They don't want to hear about your problems. They want to see what, you know, like if I'm having an issue, I'll just go there or something going on with my family. I'm not running out of minutes. You only get 300 minutes a month. So if something going on, I can't call no more to them. I validate. So I just go there, go to them and say, you know, I need to talk. And they say, what's wrong with me? I say, I just want you to hear now. But well, I can give you a prescription for Zoloft, you know, and that'll kind of yell you out. I, I, don't want, I don't want that. I want you to hear what I have to say. But they wasn't really willing to listen because, like, when you get on site, there, it's almost like you're on a pay me no mind. It's because, you know, your mind become altered and stuff like that. You be sedated half of the day. You know, you don't want to get up and depressed. So I've never taken anything like that, but it's just really crazy when it comes to the mental health because a lot of people deal with things, but they want to talk about it. They need to get it out. If you don't get it out, you suppress it. It's not good, especially in there. Well, do you have access to any group therapy? Well, I used to do a, call, a, a group called Victim Impact, but most of the time it's just me and my friends counseling me. You know, one of my friends, she was my roommate, she was there with me. And, she went home and, you know, she would, we would talk about different things and, you know, just at nighttime, just talk about it. They were like my counselors for me because we share everything. They were really like my family because they spent just as so much time with me as my family did on the outside. So they know me, a side of me that my family don't know, you know? Understood. Understood. So, Danielle, now just talk to us about what it was like um, to know that your name was on the list to be considered by President Obama. I was just thrilled, like, kind of in disbelief because, you know, when I was in there, you know, I used to, you know, like I said, I wanted to stay healthy, so I always had extra vegetables and stuff, you know. 
actually the financial need of y'all help us everything. You know, I still want to cook like I see the cuisine magazine. So I always had my little vegetables and stuff. And so that morning when um well when I was getting ready to go before I got ready to go, I went to a gospel show. Like on a Sunday. It was just something I woke up that morning and I was just tired and I knew that I was going in and out with the missus coming whenever his, you know, the missus come out, my name wasn't on there. I would call my lawyer, I called my family. I was like, my name still ain't on there. You know, my name not on there again. You know, all the time my name wasn't on there. And I was just like, it, it was just getting to me because I know the window of opportunity was closing as far as the president goes, President Obama. And I was, I was just devastated. And I told, I think I told my sister, I said, you know what, this is it. I'm giving up. She said, oh no, babe, a breakthrough coming through. Here we go with a breakthrough. I said, another, another breakthrough. 23 years, this breakthrough ain't come through yet. <laughs> I'm still talking about this breakthrough. So I called, she said, just hold on a little while longer, Boosie, your time coming. I'm like, okay, all right. I said, but well, my name ain't on ya. She said, oh, it's gonna be on there though. It's gonna be on there. Trust that the Lord took. I'm like, Okay, the Lord been telling us this for a long time. <laughs> and that's the same Lord I was praying to, you know. So I got up that morning. It was the only time that I really had made a declaration like this. I got up that morning after I came from the gospel show. Uh, it was on a Saturday, that Sunday. And I just packed my stuff. I had stuff that I had civilian clothes for when they even had clothes. Because remember, I was the girl that never was going to leave. So a lot of times if I had different clothing that other people didn't have, they would wonder where I got it from, they didn't know how long I had been there. Mm -hmm. So the office was just kind of like, let her have it, that's the one who's not gonna leave, so don't pay her no mind. You know like when the office come and do their training, they say, why she have so much stuff that thing you know, she got all the time, she ain't leaving, so we kind of just let her have that stuff. So you started packing your stuff? I started packing my stuff and my friend came that morning and she says, uh, what are you doing with all that stuff? I had mountains of clothes everywhere. And I said, I'm getting ready to leave. And she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. And I had prayed that night. And again, another one of my roommates had left. So it was, you know, it was like me watching people leave all the time and I'm being left behind. It had gotten to the point where people who, you know, come back to prison as a revolver, they would leave their clothes with me because they knew I was going to be there. So they said, boo, hold your sweatsuit for me. So if I come back, you already have my sweatsuit for me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so I, you know, I would hold it for them because if they, if I didn't hold it for them, I end up buying them one anyway when they come back. So, you know, I hold it for them sometimes. And so I woke up and I, my friend, she saw this. I said, look, here's a whole bottle of perfume or everything that we have. I said, take whatever you want. Whatever you see in here you want, you can have it. I said, because after this, I'm giving everything away. She said, where is you going? And I said, I'm going on. And she was like, all right, all I'm taking is my kids' pictures and it's expansion for this the only thing I'm bringing on the plane. She said, oh, on the plane? Okay. <laughs> she said, now tomorrow, when he, she said, I ain't giving you none of this stuff back when you come around. I said, I don't want it back. I don't want it back. So anyway, that then the Monday came, I, I slipped my pawn I was all cried out because my roommate left. And sometimes by me being there for such a long time, they would give me the opportunity to be in a room by myself sometimes. So they said, give her a break, you know, because we three people to a room. And so sometimes I would be with two, you know, they give me the privilege of having two at a time. And then that time they said, we're going to give you a break because you, you need to be by yourself for a little while. So I was by myself and I was all crying out. And I got up that morning and I just said, Lord, I, can't, I don't have another day. I, don't have, I can't do another day. I'm tired. You know, I'm just like I'm burnt out. You know, my mom, she's getting sicker and, you know, I'm hearing things. You know, my sister telling me she's getting sick and I'm like, you know, I, I don't want to hear that at all. And I was like, okay, okay. And so I packed all my things and I, I just said I was leaving. And that morning, I slipped my ponytail, went on about my business. Then Tuesday morning, I just was getting ready to do my, you know, vegetable run. That's when I bring all my vegetables to the unit, you know, because they let me walk across the yard because they know she got vegetables on the let her go here. You know, she got all the vegetables. So I was getting ready to walk across the yard and they said, oh, next they want you. And I said, they want me. She was like, yeah, I said, hold on, let's take these eggs off me. <laughs> so I got ready to go down there. And then I was like, what's going on? They wanted me to come to the, you know, the lieutenant office. I was like, what's going on? He said, they want to talk to me. And I was like, well, remember, I don't have no clothes because you let me go into the shoe somewhere, a special housing unit. Everybody gets all your belongings for you because they're going to throw them away. So I gave everything away. So everybody said, you want us to pack it out? I said, I gave away everything. Remember, so I don't have nothing to pack out. So they called me and you know, I went in there and you know, it, they pulled a little prank on me and told me that I had the Rolling Stones article 
And he said, I didn't follow proper protocol. He didn't come in. And I was like, well, I didn't let him come in. They was like, well, you didn't do it. But that was a true state. That's something that ain't really happened. Okay. So they were kind of upset with me about that because they said, um, I let, you know, the people just came while all of them went to training, but I can't get the people in the prison to do it. <laughs> but that was my fault, so I was like, okay. So, you know, but that's me, them thinking I'm trying to manipulate the system or something like that. So I said, okay. So when they called me in there and everybody moving around, all this movement, I'm watching everybody moving, I'm like, look, I'm trying to get the war in the sand with this one saying. I said, I can't concentrate. I told the lady, she said, what's wrong? I said, I just can't concentrate. There's too much movement in here. You know, everybody moving, the warden, they're making all these phone calls, you know, in a page set. I don't know what's going on. And so my lawyer had called me, asked me, you know, what was going on, where was I? I told him I was in the warden complex. He said, are you sitting down? I said, well, no, I'm not sitting down yet. I said, but they're questioning me about this article and stuff. You know, they're harassing me about, he said, everything will be okay, just calm down. So I sat down, and he said, take a seat, just take a seat, calm down. And I took a seat, he told me, he says, uh, the Justice Department had, you know, signed my claim. And I was like, what, President Obama had signed my And at that moment, every tear I suppressed for all the years just came out. I, I cried for about 45, 50 minutes. I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. But I was so thrilled, like, but at the same time, I didn't want to come out there after I had came to, because it was almost like I had an out-of-body experience. You know, I started just shaking and everything, and I, it's like I had left my body for a minute. And I started, you know, crying. And when I started crying, I was like, man, I can't believe it. But I didn't want to go outside and celebrate because I knew how it felt when other people was left behind. So some of the people in there that, you know, had started, like the office started the time with me, you know, one of them told me, she said, you better go out there and let them know the Lord is real. I said, well, they know the Lord is real, but I can't tell them, you know, because I don't know how I feel. And every time somebody got home, not that I wasn't happy for them, but I wanted it to be me. And if a person didn't understand it, I don't know what to tell them, because that's really was my true feeling. And I was like, I was happy for them, but I was like, when is my time going to come? So I was like, I didn't want to walk out there and tell, tell them. So when I walked out there, I was just quiet. They said, what happened? You going home, you going home, you going home? I was like, yeah, I'm going home. You know, I'm going. But I didn't want to tell everybody because, you know, I know they, I left some life was behind. And I know how they felt. You know, a lot of times when those listeners would come out, people would be all about the washing machine, all about that, all about that. But they really was mad because their name wasn't on the list. Because I, I would always know, I said, well, the listening came out. Everybody, he just stuff out my wash time. Don't do this. You didn't turn the TV. I said, it just mad. But I was, I never knew I was mad. They said, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm mad. My name ain't on the list. I'm straight up, I'm mad. So I was just telling the truth. So they knew when the list come out, don't bother me. So Jennifer, tell us. What is it like to be free? It's just a beautiful thing. I always, you know, tell myself like F is for freedom, R is for resilience, E is for elevation, E is for involvement, D is for determination, O is for overcoming, and M is for the movement. I'm free. Wow. Thank you. So. Do you feel that it is, how has your transition back home been? It's been a beautiful experience, you know, um, just seeing how God can change everything in your life. You know, I always talk about the president, and I love him to death, but I know everything comes from God. And I know he placed people in those positions so this could take place. So I always want to always acknowledge God first before anything, because he, he done so much in my life, kept my mom up inside back there, and you know, it was it was a bittersweet kind of because the one thing that I thought, or the one person that I thought would always be here would be my mother. And like eight months, seven months after I got here, she passed. So you know, I had dreams of taking her to New York and doing all this stuff. And you know, when I met her, she told me it's nothing to cry about. We gonna see, it's everything gonna be happy now. And you know, she's not here to see how I'm involved in and coming in here. The person that she always tell me, like, you know, she would always say, you need a job, boo, everybody need a job. You know, no matter what you think, you need a job. If you, you come to the house, you got a job, she gonna treat you good. If you ain't got no job, she too much don't want me bothered. She said, just don't bring me back. <laughs> so then now, President Obama recognized your blueness and your potential to impact so talk to us, how have you accepted his challenge to use your life? 
Well, what I do first of all is um, I mentor young girls. And anytime I can tell my story to someone to encourage them, that's what I do. I um, work for the Fit Clinic, which is the former incarcerated transition clinic on the Tulane University. And um, those people are coming back, transitioning. And, and it's hard when you come back, you don't have family members. In fact, I met a guy yesterday, he had done 22 years. He didn't have, you know, he said nobody, lived, you know, all his family members had died off and everything. And a lot of people don't have support when they come back. So I used my story to motivate them. Then I started telling them about the resources that I had, like Americo and about Sarita and about different people that offered me an opportunity to get a job. And I was going to work every day for Americo and my brother. He was driving to work every day. And for some reason, I thought I was supposed to be sitting in a big old office somewhere, you know, with no education or anything. So I was sitting in my ride every day to work. I told him, I said, I'm not going to be fixing no boxes every day. They got these this stuff. And I guess my brother won't hurt my feelings. Well, well, she's going to go with your education. All you got is a GED. But he said, boo, just keep going, keep going. I said, yeah, but I'm tired of fixing these boxes. But I wasn't tired because I go in there and fix about a thousand boxes a day. <laughs> but I just wanted somebody to hear what I had to say because although I was just blessed to be out there fixing boxes, so I, every day I was thankful and grateful. So, and if I could wake up in prison for 29 cents, I could come out here for minimum wage. And I'm free to and can ride down the street in a hot shop. Do whatever I want to do, go get my hair fixed, wipe the makeup off, go get my polish, whatever I want to do, I can do it. So I had nothing to complain about, but my brother told me, just keep on getting up. And I'm seeing how God keeps placing people in my life, you know, that I work for pure violence under the city of uh, New Orleans, under the mayor. Miss Tanisha Stevens, a crime commission, and you know, they always tell me they want me to succeed and they're proud of me, and that makes me feel good because coming from where I've come from, there's always been a stigma because I'm not the same person sitting on the other side of the table. I'm Danielle Metzen, you know, who has the conviction opposed to the people that don't have the conviction. So I have to always work a little harder, and you know, my supervisor, when I'm around different people, we have these meetings and stuff. She challenged me because she said, oh, Danielle handles everything. I'm like, Danielle handles what? You know, she said, go ahead. You know, that lets me know that she trusts me enough to put the, whatever she wants in my hand. And she knows I'm going to do the best job, the best job that I can because I would never tell her I can't do something. Because if I can't do something, I'm going to run home and call my brother, call my niece and say, girl, they want me to do this. Now, what am I going to do? My brother said, you just going to do it. I'm like, but I don't know how to do all this. He said, you know how to do it. Just do it. And I just try to do what I can do. Well, then uh, you and I are about the same age, and you have young adult children as well now. So, right. and I'm a grandmother. And a grandmother. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Victory. The book of the baby. baby. Oh, she's beautiful. She's everything that I imagined. You know, my daughter had two miscarriages while I was away, and that was the one time that I, the second time was the one time that I thought that I really could make it. That I really, that was the one time that I really didn't want to go on, because it was like, how can you keep doing this to her? And she's just the perfect daughter, you know? I mean, I, my son told me one time, you know, about my daughter, he said she's the closest thing he can go to God. And I said, wow. He loves his sister, and I guess he said, you know, she's different, and she wants to be different, but I think about it all the time, and I'm like, when I see my grandbaby, in fact, just Friday, I flew out there to California, and I had to celebrate the party, said they had to make it back here Sunday, be ready for work on Monday, but it's like, wow, but I'm here. So I went out there, my daughter gave me a list at 6 o'clock in the morning, she said, I want all this done by 10. I said, okay. So I got in my car, learned how to use the navigation. I had to go get the balloon, do this, do that. She took a whole, all the living room set out and made it out a party theme. And I was like, wow, but she's so precious. She's so precious. And when I look at her, all, everything that's happened to me is like as a prayer. Everything that I prayed about is, I'm seeing it manifest. So, you know, every day I should just be praising God every chance I get, every chance I get because Everything I did, it comes from him. I, I don't even know my friend. In fact, my childhood friend, she came to my job the other day, and I'm, I'm sitting up there, you know, at 1555 Porter Street. She come up there, and she looked, and she said, mm, 
what is you doing? I was sitting there acting like I'm writing and doing everything. And doing everything. She said, I'm who would have ever thought. I said, I know, right? And that was the first time I said, well, you know what? I'm going to go walk around Champion Square and see. And I was just walking. I was so happy. I just started crying like, I'm really out here. But sometimes I have to, you know, let it sink in again that I'm really free. You know? And I was just walking and walking. And one guy just stopped me. I'm like, yeah, yeah. But everybody, I guess my face looked the same. He was like, yeah, yeah, I'm Glenn Peters. I was like, where well, from? He said, come on, you don't remember me? I was like, no, he said, every time I see you, bless me, girl. I said, for real? I said, he said, yeah, and it was just like, for real, he said, I'm so happy you're home, you know. And these people in this room, they're happy to see me, you know, just home. They come out to celebrate and support me and let me know that I'm going to be okay, because that's what I just asked my mom as I saw her changing and, you know, beginning a transition. I always asked, I said, mom, I'm going to be all right? She said, you're going to be all right? I said, but I ain't got no money, I ain't got nothing. She said, you're going to be all right. You gonna be all right. And I said, okay. And I, I hang on to that all the time when I get depressed or I get in my mood. I'm like, you know, stop feeling down. I always say, I'm gonna be all right. And I am okay because I have people like y'all who support me. And I could call any of these people and, and talk about anything. They put up with me because I'm something else. <laughs> I, I, I am something else. But then, you know, we are all grateful that you are home. Thank and that you have the opportunity, and you're doing it, girl. You're using your life, your mother and your kids, and your grandchild. Mm -hmm. And we are all so very, so very happy and proud for you. Mm -hmm. So could you all please join me in giving Danielle a round of applause. questions and now we're going to turn to the audience to ask questions that you might have. My name is Robin Hayes and um, I want to tell you that I don't know you personally but I'm happy you're home Thank and your story really touches me because my dad in prison. And when he came home, I didn't know who he was. So my question to you is, how have you gotten to children again? I'm sorry, repeat the last part. How have you gotten to reacquaint yourself with children as their mother? Well, every day I'm still reacquainting myself because even with my son, and you know, I tell him things about myself. Uh, when I let him read chapters of my book, he says he's learning more about me or who I am. And I have to, you know, sometimes I have to be careful what I disseminate because I don't want kids to glorify nothing that I did that was wrong. I want them to see the new me. And I have to tell that to my son sometimes because, you know, when the media portrays you as something that you're not, you have to do everything to change that or you have to show them who you really are. And um, me and my son was riding, I guess sometimes he don't like me to tell nobody nothing about it. But anyway, <laughs> we were riding, right? And um, he was telling me he wouldn't hang on the corner. And I told him, I said, why? I said, they're just hanging out. He said, that's just not me. And I said, oh, OK. And so um, we were just talking, and he was telling me about, uh, well, right after we was talking about it, guys was just hanging out. He said, um, somebody ended up getting killed on the corner. So he said, see, my that's why I wouldn't, you wouldn't catch me around nothing like that. I said, well, they wasn't doing nothing. I said, well, you right, kind of. I said, because, you know, I would have been scared if I had got shot. I probably would have just died from the wound. And he said, you would have died? What you mean? I said, because I ain't never had a gun before. I never shot a gun. I never possessed a gun. He said, what? I said, yeah, what you thought? He said, well, come on now. I said, no. So he needed to know that because whatever he was hearing or whatever people told him, they gave him some misinformation, some bad information. And so he thinking I'm one way and I'm another way. So that's why I need to tell my own story rather than let somebody else tell it for me. Yeah. And it kind of broke my heart, not broke my heart, but I'm like, well, who do we think I am? You know, like, what did he think? But that, that's how every day I'm re, re, getting reacquainted with him. You know, he changed thoughts and, you know, 
he expressed who he is, I express who I am, I respect who he is, he respect who I am. Because when I came home, for some reason I thought he was going to leave his girlfriend of the life that he had and come run behind me. I thought my daughter was going to leave her husband and come run behind me, and that didn't happen. And I was like, well, what happened? You know, that's what I thought, but I had to realize life had passed me by. I had to fit in, get in where I fit in. Because, you know, I wasn't there to raise them, and they did the best, they, but they couldn't give up their life for me. You're welcome. Any more questions? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jermaine Baker Fox, and I'm from Central City, and I'm just so grateful to be here to hear Boo. And when her name was on that list, because her family and community struggled and we was hurt because of what happened. I even wanted to go tell Harry Rosenberg, oh, because he was the district of the attorney at that time. But I just would like to say, Boo had and still have a loving family that stood by her in the midst of all of her trials and tribulations. And we just so grateful that President Obama signed the thing for her to come home. And that day she was coming home, we had a praise party at the church. Because I told them my cousin was coming home. Because nobody could believe what had been done. And so I'm just so proud of you, Boo. Danielle Bernal met. And we love you. And Pam and the rest of the family is here. And we love you. Thank you. Great evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, but to Danielle. As I look at the museum where they have you and other former incarcerated women, and I think about the location of this museum and the difference they can have an impact and have on young girls who come up in the same community you come up in that have an outlook about what this picture looked like that may not be able to uh, access the museum here to really see these stories and be impacted by these stories. What's being, being, what's being put in place to make sure these young girls that come out in the ghetto that need to hear and see these stories, what are being done to make sure that they'll be able to see these, these women in this museum and hear these stories and know what difference it can be on their lives? That question is to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, what I do is, you know, you know the work that I do. And um, every young girl that I talk to that's involved in whatever kind of life that's not right or that's not, well, I let them know that this too, what happened to me, can happen to them. Now, I can't always bring them all to the museum because, of course, some of them don't even know that the museum is here. They don't know the things are being, dis you know, displayed. They don't know about the, um, the exhibition out there, but I tell them everything that I could. And I also, you know, have my own foundation called From Prep Red is the Prison. And what I do is I go inside the schools and I talk to young folks, men, young girls, and young boys about drugs, educate them on everything that I could and that I can for as the system and how it works. Because like with me, no one ever told me I could get a life sentence. Even when they told it to me, I didn't believe it because I'm like, they're going to give me 20 years probation. I've never been in prison before. And in fact, I begged the judge for 20 years and, you know, the pre-sentence lady said, you, I don't think you understand what's going on here. I said, but I ain't going to get in trouble no more, I promise. So, you know, I didn't even know what could happen to me, but it makes a difference if you know. When you don't know, then you don't know. But I use my story to educate them. And I hope that, you know, we can take this museum and probably put it in Shakespeare Park. It don't have to be in two lane. You know, thank God that it is here. This is the first time I ever saw it, and it's a beautiful museum. But we need to, like you say, you know, just like if we tell somebody somebody got shot, we could tell them about the museum. You know how we call it that buzz network and tell everybody what's going on, like, oh, you heard this, you heard about the guy in um, California. That's the same way we can do about them, you know? So that's what we have to do. We have to spread the word. And um, 
you work for different organizations, so you can, you know, your voice is being heard. You talk to the mayor, you talk to different people, you talk to Tanisha. Then let's get together and tell them about the program that we want to see in our community and where our people and where we will be more impactful at. Hi, Zaya. Hi, Teresa. I'm so proud of you and I'm so happy today to be here. Um, I just want you to talk about it now. I often have a conversation about how if we could be our young self, our young girl, 19, 20 year old again, like what would we tell ourselves back then? And I think for me, you always talk about um, something that's very enlightening about how you just wanted to know that it was okay that you were like a victim or you know in certain relationships that you, you could get out of for like um, not even realizing that you were in like a toxic situation so i think uh, it's a good time and a good opportunity to kind of like educate people about being able to notice and see and be able to identify because you know our community we don't think that we are victim of any um, we just learn how to deal with it. So if you tell yourself, you know, at 24 right now, what would be the one thing that you tell yourself? Well, for one thing, whatever I was going through, the first thing I would talk to somebody about it. Because a lot of time when you're dealing with shame and guilt, you don't want people to know what goes on inside your household. Uh, you want everybody to see that everything is perfect. Uh, you paint this picture perfect image. And a person can't help you unless you tell them what you're going through. You know, my brothers and sisters, I, I think they love me. They'll do anything for me. And if I would have told them the type of situation that I was in or what I was going through, they would have made a way for me to get out of it. Or uh, better yet, just put a stop to it. But a lot of things I didn't tell my parents or my friends, and even now they're still learning things about me that I never told anybody. So this is like therapeutic for me. And we all need lifetime therapy. You know, we'd have been through so much from just kids and things that we don't even talk about. So all the young girls, you know, like finding somebody that you can confide in or somebody that you can tell something to or somebody that you trust to tell whatever you're going through to. You know, you have to let them know. We can't help, you know, you can't heal what can't be seen. Uh, you can't, you know, expose it. You have to put it out there first so you can begin to get help from anywhere. You know, a lot of times if I don't tell somebody something going on, they will never know because I'm always covered in everything. You know, I had a lot of things. Even, you know, I'm very sensitive. I know, you know, I take everything personal. You know, I think everybody, you know, me, me home. You know, and that's from the things that I've been through, because I've been through trauma. You know, just imagine me at 26 going into prison and my lifestyle from one boyfriend to the next. I've never gotten any counseling. I never talked to anybody about anything that I feel or whatever I've gone through. And sometimes, even now, when I get through saying it now, it's freeing for me, but it's my truth, because when you're standing there, truth, you know, it's like it's fine, because you don't want people to know these type of things. But that's when the healing begins, when you get the exposing it. And so, anything that um, I talk about or whatever I've been through, it, it's not for the people. I'm not trying to impress, I'm, I'm here to me. I'm getting me together, I'm cleaning me out, I'm getting me together first. Well, I can even help anybody, I have to deal with me. So that's what it's all about, dealing with yourself and, and being truthful about whatever you're going through. Hello, Hi. Uh, my name is Courtney Randolph and um, I want to thank you for your story, it's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, so I have not heard your story. However, I'm familiar. You don't have to be from here to understand this. It's, it's everywhere. Right. Um, they never made it to my question back there, just now. But what I wanted, the next thing I wanted to ask you would be, um, upon reentry, did you have any fear? You know, you've been going 23 years, so there's a lot that's different from then to now. Did you find any difficulties with that? And if so, what were they? Or were you just, I'm here, figure it out? Well, when I first came home, I, I, what I, everybody always asked me that question because when I was walking through the airport, my daughter said, you're not nervous? Because she thought I was going to be nervous. I said, no, I had to get used to being in prison. I was used to being free. 
I had to get used to being in prison, so I know what it felt like to be free. And I prayed about this. And when I got home, the only obstacle that I really had for is because everything was dealing with technology. And when I left, they had big old phones like this, and now everybody on the phone, on the phone, that kind of thing. But even with that, I learned how to navigate through it. And I still have people, you know, I'm in, I go to school know for social work. And some things I don't know, but I always have somebody I can call on to help, you know, help me navigate me through it. So it wasn't, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was when I was coming out because my family was there for me and people gathered around me and, you know, I got a ride from here, I got a ride from there and everything that I needed, they kind of provided for me. I got a job, you know, I got a job through AmeriCorp and I was working there. And then from there, you know, people recognized the work I did there and then I got promoted there. So I started seeing me, you know, just elevate my mind and stuff and it made me want to do more something I should have done 20 something years ago, but it's never too late. And so I got the opportunity, so everything I wanted to do in prison, I'm doing it now. Hi there, y'all. My name is Shalisa Morgan. I'm a federal probation officer. My question to you is, what are the things that you could recommend to us coming into our office, coming under our supervision, that you wish services, resources, what are some things that you think that we could or should have provided for you that maybe we haven't at this point or maybe for the next person that we come into contact with that we can provide for them? Well, the first thing I would like to exercise termination for me. <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah, that's a process, but that's the first thing. Because uh, I'm thinking that you all see somebody, you know, and my probation officer tell you just the other day, I asked her, anywhere I asked her to go, she had to just let me go. And I thank God for and you know, I, I was transferred through like four different probation probation officers, so it was kind of like hard for me, you know, like because I can use the one person, then another person, then another person, then, I mean, no point intended, but this time it was a black one, so I'm like, oh, we about to really run into trouble, now me and her, like, and she young too, uh, this about to be a problem, yeah. and so um, she always, so the other day she called me and she says, I'm about to come to your house. I said, wait a minute, you forgot you told me I'd go out of town? I said, and then I wrote it back, I said, you're about to give me cardiac arrest, because I know I'm where I'm supposed to be. She said, oh, I forgot, just calm down. But just, I think, like, for me, it would be, like, be a little more lenient to the people, because when you're coming out of prison, like, for me, of course, we, it's like we all, it's like we, it's, for me, it's like I'm still in prison. I say I'm free, but... I ain't gonna do nothing else in this lady, and I'm gonna do everything that I'm supposed to do because I, I don't want to go back to prison under no circumstances for nothing and nobody. So I try to do everything, but it's always like, you know, you're walking on eggshells. You know, you're worried about this, you're worried about that. If you, like, everybody raise their hand and say they got somebody that's in prison, so how can you not even communicate with somebody that's in prison? If everybody got a family member that's in prison in here, you know, so I just hope that you guys would like be a little more lenient to them and, you know, give them all the resources and the reforms that you can and help them as best as you can because a lot of them don't have family when they come out here. And like Sarita from Operation Restoration, she didn't know me, but she knew that I was from New Orleans and she started advocating for me like, like the last 120 days, but she did a lot of work for me running behind. Oh, Mr. Pony for me trying to help me and everything. And when I got there, she said, V, I got you. But everybody don't have that when they come home. And so she made sure that I had the things that I need. She brought me down sometimes with my sister to get my uh, social security. Whatever she, whatever I needed, she did that. But I think sometimes the probation officer offer that to the people as well. Because when you get out, nobody's there for you. You know, you got to learn how to catch the bus, especially after 20 years. If you don't have somebody to know how to do all these things, then what are you going to do? It's easy for you to go back to doing what you know how to do, yes. opposed to doing what you should be doing. You know, so just I would hope that you all would just be a little more lenient and um, understanding. understanding, yeah, and don't be so judgmental to them. You know, because we already feel some type of way because we have to come in 
report everything and do everything, you know. Soon as I, I had to call the lady up, she didn't tell me to call, but I said, oh, I got a ticket because I had no seatbelt on. She was like, well, you know, keep your seatbelt on, that's the law. I'm like, okay. I, 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 I couldn't, soon as I saw the officer, I got nervous, started sweating. I was like, oh, my God. like I, I don't even want no tinted windows on my car. Like, don't stop me for nothing. You know, no. But uh, I called and I told her, I said, oh, Miss Walton, I just want you to know that, you know, they pulled me over. And she said, well, what happened? And I told her. And she said, okay. But it's like everything is still like a form of prison. You know, after 23 years, what, I got to be on probation? Would you think I won't go back to jail? But it is what it is, but whatever. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.